So turning your Bibles to now Matthew chapter 18. Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Every football team wants to be number one. Every, you know, when you do business, you want to succeed. You want to, you want to do well in, in everything we do. So the question is, uh, how are we successful in God's eyes? In, the world might judge success based on our bank account, right? Or how popular we are. How, how else might the world judge success? Health, maybe? There's a lot of different ways the, the world might judge success, but how does, how does God judge success? So Matthew chapter 18, 1 through 5. This story also is, by the way, recorded in, in Mark and in uh, Luke. Starts off, at that time, or your Bible may say hour. Uh, the Greek is hora, which is interesting because it, it's indefinite. The Bible usually translate this, just translate this as time. Uh, specifically, it means hour. Literally means hour, but it's kind of like we say in the hour of decision or in, in, in the hour of my trial. It's, it's kind of a vague thing. It, it's a specific time, but it can mean a wide period of time. And so just generally at that time or around that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child whom he placed among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change, or maybe your Bible says turn or convert, unless you change, turn, convert, and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes a humble place, becoming like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Well, that was kind of counterintuitive, wasn't it? Who's really great in the kingdom of heaven? Well, a phenomenal youth pastor or, or a great worship leader. Who's great in the kingdom of heaven? Therefore, whoever takes a humble place, becoming... Like this little kid. I wonder what the kid was doing. Was he squirming, grinning? We know his child's big enough to walk, so he came over there, standing right in front of Jesus. Everybody's looking at him. You know how kids get goofy when they're in front of everybody. And Jesus says, whoever is willing to take a lowly place. Kids, when they speak up, it's not like all the adults drop everything and pay attention. It's, when, when kids speak up, their voice is not heard in the same way that, a, that the adults' voices are heard. Jesus says, therefore, whoever takes a humble place, becoming like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever becomes one, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Well, Jesus is making a a couple revolutionary assertions here. First, that we must become humble and dependent like children. Children, they, they need mom and dad. When they're scared, they, they run to mom, they run to dad. When, when they need comforting, they go to mom, they go to dad. Children in that respect aren't self-reliant. They, they're needy and they know they need their parents. And secondly, uh, we see that uh, we actually demonstrate our humility by loving and serving people that society sees as unimportant. Oh, let's welcome this person, they're a millionaire. Let's w- w- welcome this person, they're a big deal. Let's welcome this person, they're, they're a teacher at school or, or, a bi- or a head of a business. Let's, Jesus says, whoever welcomes the unimportant person, the little kid, welcomes them in my name, bringing them, welcome to, pouring love on them, bringing them to Jesus. Whoever does that uh, demonstrates humility and in, in, in does that in the name of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is basically saying, who is great in my kingdom? Brothers and sisters, who's great in Christ's kingdom? And Jesus says, the people who welcome a child in my name, when they do so, they're actually welcoming me. Such a person is great. How, how do we define greatness? Not like this. The world doesn't understand this, but brothers and sisters, Christians, I think we have a hard time understanding this too. Who's really great? A humble person. A person who knows they need God like a child knows they need their parents. And then what's a great thing to do? Spend time loving and blessing 
people that need help, people like children. 18, uh, 2 through 4, the IVP, InterVarsity, Bible, uh, InterVarsity Press, background Bible commentary, points out that the most powerless members of ancient society were little kids. In most ancient society, age increased one's social status and authority. In Jewish culture, children were loved, not despised. But the point is that they had no status apart from that love. They had no status apart from that love and no power or privileges apart from what they received as total dependence on their parents. So what's our status? Well, we find it in the love of Jesus Christ. J. Vernon McGee uh, recounted the following couple stories, and uh, one of them is about uh, D.L. Moody. I think some of you probably heard this story before. Uh, D.L. Moody uh, was coming home one night late after a revival meeting. And his family asked him how many converts did he make that night. And this great evangelist said, two and a half. His family said, oh, you mean two adults and one child uh, who accepted the Lord as Savior. Moody replied, no, no, no. Two children and one adult. The adult's an old man. He only has half a life left to give to the Lord. He was just half a convert. The little children, they were full converts. Two and a half. And then J. Vernon McGee recounts this story of, of little children being important. A Scottish a pastor of a Scottish church turned in his resignation years ago. As he did so, the elders asked him, why? Why are you resigning? Well, he replied, for the past year, I've only had one convert. I wish I had a Scottish accent. We Bobby Moffat. Right now I'm hearing something about dilithium crystals and engines, given all you got. But Bobby Moffat was the man who opened up, the Af opened up Africa to missionary work. It was the biggest year that preacher ever had. In these verses, the Lord is putting emphasis on little children. I've often heard it said that evangelism is child evangelism. Have you ever heard it said in our culture, don't force your religion on kids. Let them make up their own. Have you ever heard that? I always ask those parents, do you make your kids brush their teeth? Don't force them to brush their teeth. Let them decide on their own. Because brushing their teeth is going to determine whether their soul goes to hell forever or not. Is it possible that knowing God is more important than brushing our teeth, as important as that may be? Next, Christ transitions, and he actually uses some, some language that people don't like preachers to use. Listen to this, verse 6. People don't like preachers to talk like this, and people tell, Christians tell other Christians, oh, you can't say that. Uh, you'll scare everybody away from Jesus. You can't do that. Well, if, if my message resembles the message of Jesus Christ, and people don't like to hear it, then that's okay. But if my message doesn't resemble Jesus Christ, even if I get a huge crowd, then I'm betraying God, aren't I? So look at verse 6. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone, and the word for millstone there is actually not one of these little millstones that you grind stuff with. It's a different word that's used for the kind of millstone that's by a waterway that a donkey has to pull. It's a giant millstone. You need a donkey to pull it to grind uh, this grain into flour. It would be better if this giant millstone we're tied around that person's neck and they were drowned in the depths of the sea. Come on, Jesus. I thought you were loving. Settle down, Jesus. Think that's a little bit of an overreaction? If Jesus didn't say that and I attributed those words to Jesus, that would be wrong. But Jesus did say it. 
If anyone causes a little child because of their behavior, the way they talk and the way they're doing their life, if anyone causes a little child to miss out on God, Jesus said it would be better off for that person if they had this huge stone tied around their neck and they were tossed in the deepest sea because God, God loves those kids and he wants them with him, with him in heaven. God cares about evangelism. We're the ones who don't care about evangelism. We're the ones who, who don't give enough effort. We're the ones who don't care enough. God cares. And how much does he care? He says, if your life is causing little children to miss out on the grace of Jesus Christ, Jesus said it'd be better for you if you drown in the sea with a huge rock around your neck because it's not going to go well for you in the life to come. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person from whom they come. The Adam Clark commentary says this, let those who act the part of the devil in tempting others to sin hear the declaration of the Lord and tremble. Let me read that again. Let those who act the part of the devil, and I mean we're the devil's tool, in tempting others to sin, let them hear this declaration of the Lord and let them tremble. Jesus is deadly serious, brothers and sisters, on the issue of heaven and hell, and deadly serious about the issue of child evangelism. It's not God. When you hear somebody say, say, make a value statement, find out where that value statement comes from. People say, you can't talk about politics or religion. Well, I can see don't talk about politics, that's a cultural rule. Don't talk about religion. Wait, that's also a cultural rule. And Jesus says, go and make disciples of all people. Teach them to obey everything I've taught you. So am I going to follow society's rules or am I going to be obedient to God? Which set of values are higher? And when people tell you, don't share your faith with children, that's not the Holy Spirit talking. Does it even sound like the Holy Spirit? Don't tell children that God loves them. Don't tell children that God wants to be with them. That sounds like a lie out of the pit of hell because he doesn't want anybody to go to heaven and the devil knows the math. He knows the numbers. Child evangelism is evangelism. Most people who get saved, most people who will be going to heaven became Christians while they were still young. We've, we're blessed with a church where a lot of people came to Jesus or came back to Jesus later on. But in general... The devil doesn't want us to talk to the kids about Jesus. They don't want us to take our kids to Sunday school class. They don't want mom and dad living their faith. Because the devil knows if I can get them out of high school without being saved, their chances go way down. Jesus is deadly serious about this. How, I mean... Sometimes we think, well, that preacher's got too much fire and brimstone. What's wrong with him? Jesus said, if a person leads a child away from Christ, it's better if a millstone is tied around their neck and they're crossed in the deep sea. How much more serious could Christ get about this? And do you feel like, in your heart, do you feel like sometimes we don't take these things seriously enough? Christ, who is better, wiser, higher than us, thought this was of extraordinary importance. The devil doesn't want us to bring kids to Jesus. We need to understand that what we do, everything we do, our lives, the direction, the momentum of our life, the purpose of our life, we're either bringing people close to Jesus or pushing people away. And you might say, well, I'm not living for the devil. I'm not pushing people away. But... When people look at you, do they think, that person loves the Bible? When people look at you, do they say, that person is a follower of Jesus Christ? Or do they say, well, that person is pretty cool, and they don't really care about God, so why should I? See, you don't have to be doing bad things. But if you're an example, if you're living a life, as, your example is that I've got more important things to do on Sunday. I've got a higher, better priorities. All these things are taking a higher priority in my life, then what, are, what is my life doing? It's actually leading people away from Christ. And little kids are watching dad especially, even more than mom. 
think I shared with you a, a study that was done. Um, it was done by a non-Christian group, and they, they studied religion in uh, different religions, but they studied religion and the role of mom and dad. And uh, when mom and dad were together and both going to church or synagogue or the mosque or whatever, the kids had a higher rate of following their parents into their faith. When mom and dad were separate or dad was busy or dad was working, it was a mom thing, guess what? Kids just fell off the planet. Because it's not important to dad. He's the big guy. He's the strong guy. Not important to dad. Mom makes me go to church, you know. And they didn't value it. You know something that's really weird? And I'm not, this, is, this was a secular study. Please listen. I'm not advocating divorce. <laughs> it's a weird element to the study. It shocked the people who did the study. When mom's not at home because maybe she died or there was a divorce and just dad is there, and dad takes the kids to church, those kids have even a higher percentage chance of following their dad into their faith than when mom and dad were together. I'm not, that's not to say that mom and dad's together is not important because in so many other ways that is hugely important. Okay, everybody tracking? Mom and dad together, absolutely important. But fathers, tremble. Tremble because your role is so important. If your kids are going to grow up and go to heaven, if they're going to grow up and become strong men and women of Jesus Christ, they need to see dad taking a lead in this. They need to see dad loving Jesus. The devil doesn't want you to. He does not. We need to understand that everything we do can, and everything we say, everything, however we act, we're either drawing people to Christ or we're pushing them closer to the flames of hell. God says, I want you to be gentle. I want you to be humble. I want you to be strong and courageous. And I want you to do the hard thing, the difficult thing of loving people enough to go to some difficult, uncomfortable places to win them for Jesus Christ. We need to be humble enough to acknowledge that his ways are higher than our ways. Humble enough to actually want to walk in his paths. This is, this is difficult, people. Uh, we might know intellectually that God's ways are better, right? But in your heart of hearts, way down inside, do you want to follow him? Jesus says that if we're going to follow him, we have to pick up our cross and follow him. I mean, that, those are difficult things. Jesus says if you want to be one of my true disciples, you have to become like this little child. And then a part of us starts rebelling and says, no, I'll be a Christian on my terms. But I don't really want to humble myself like that. Brothers and sisters, do we want to follow Christ? This is a great example of humility. The gospel of Matthew is just banging away at human pride again and again. What did Christ do with his disciples right before he went to the cross? He washed their feet because he says, you guys are so arrogant, I need to break you. Get down on your knees and love each other. Act like a servant to one another. So what does humility look like? Well, there's a lot of things you could write down. I just wrote down a few. Uh, what does humility look like? How about not being easily angered? What, what is it that usually makes me angry? Well, somebody's hurt my pride. What does humility look like, not being easily angered? How about not being easily upset or offended? What happens when somebody bumps into you and you're full of love? Oh, that's fine. What happens if somebody bumps into you and you're not full of love? How dare you brush against the personage of one such as I? You know, we have this idea that we are so awesome that nobody dare bump into us. What a joke. We're on this little dust, dust speck of a planet and this side this galaxy. Did you know that our sun, which is huge, there's a trillion more just like it in the Milky Way galaxy. You know how many galaxies there are? 
about a trillion, with an average of a trillion stars in each one. And in this giant, giant universe, all these trillions of galaxies, we got our Milky Way with a spiral. Do you know we're not in the middle? We're on this spiral arm, just out on the edge with all these millions and millions and billions of stars, and we're just one star that uh, we call the sun. And oh, going around is a bunch of planets. We've got this one little tiny planet. It's just like a piece of dust in this huge room, smaller than that. And we sit on that piece of dust and say, nobody better mess with me. Well, actually, I think the angels here, nobody better mess with me, you know. So it's little, and yet so full of pride. And God, who made everything, says, I'm going to go to that galaxy, to that sun, to that planet, and I'm going to let them beat me up and spit on me, and I'm going to show them what love looks like. And he gets down on his knees. And he just keeps banging away at human pride, self-righteousness. And the disciples, they're arguing, who's going to be the greatest? And what is it? Because they want to be great. And Jesus says, you want to be great? Come here, little kid. You want to be great? Become just like this little kid. This person is great in the kingdom of heaven. So not being easily angered, not being easily upset or offended. Uh, even if somebody treats us like a servant. You say, well, I want a servant's heart. I want to be a servant in the kingdom. And then somebody treats you like a servant, and you say, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Now, brothers and sisters, it's not good for us to, you know, treat each other like servants and treat each other poorly. So that's what we shouldn't do. But as individuals, we should have a heart that wants to serve others, even when they mistreat us. A humble person is strong because they're not easily knocked off stride. A humble person is caring. A humble person is interested in others. Kind of easy, isn't it? This tape recorder that we've gone in, going on in our mind all the time. What do we normally think about? Our own problems, what's going on in our life. A humble person is interested in others. They desire what's good for other people. We think about other people, even maybe they've mistreated us. Boy. I think that person's really struggling. Boy, I wish they could find more peace in Christ. A humble person prays. A humble person is teachable. A humble person submits to the authority that God has put in their lives. So I'm describing a humble person, and I think all of us found things in that list and say, yeah, I'm doing that one pretty good. That describes me, and that's good because we have a good God. God is working with us in and we do see growth, and God is making us more humble, and, and he's pulling us along. We're, we listen to that list and say, okay, yeah, working on that, getting better at that. Oh, man, not good at that, but lots better than I was a few years ago. Maybe we're not as humble as we should be, but we are further along or, or farther along than we were a few years ago or even sometimes a couple months ago. But, you know, we probably also heard a few things in that list, and you thought, uh-oh, I got a lot of work to do. That, is that probably true? When I was reading that list, thought there's some things in there that I, that I need to get to work on. You know, a proud person is just the opposite of a humble person. A proud person is easily perturbed. I almost didn't put my, that word in there because I wasn't sure I'd be able to pronounce it properly. Perturbed. A proud person is easily perturbed. A proud person is up, often upset and often feels if it's, as if people have offended them. So do I go around feeling like I've been offended all the time? Brothers and sisters, the problem is probably not outside if that's the case. The problem is probably right here. Can I say that again? If I always go around feeling offended, like who do they think they are? What have they done? If I'm always upset at my boss, at my coworkers, at my family, maybe the problem isn't out there, right? Maybe the problem is the way I cope with what's out there. A proud person really takes no joy in serving others unless they're going to get something out of it, you know, elevation or praise or prestige. A proud person takes no joy in serving others, especially if that person spoke or acted harshly to them. A proud person isn't very caring or interested in others because a proud person sees the world only through their own point of view. It's hard for them to understand what other people think and feel the way they do. A proud person allows the pr a proud person is always attributing the very worst motives to other people. Have you ever noticed you're doing yourself to that? Well, they're doing that because, 
And you don't know what's, you're not a mind reader. I'm not a mind reader. But we just assume that if they did that, it's because there are all these boom, 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 boom. We just attribute the very worst possible motives to other people uh, because of our pride. A proud person doesn't often think in terms of, how can I bless this person? Lord God, I want to be a blessing to this person. Show me how. It doesn't come often to a proud person's prayers. Brothers and sisters, does that sound like a good prayer for us to be playing, praying? Right now, half of you are saying, wait, I just dozed out. What was that? I can, you know, I can see. I'm not attributing the worst motives, but a good prayer would be, God, how can I be a blessing to this person? What do they need? What do they need to hear? Do they need a hug? What kind of encouragement can I bring? What kind of challenge can I bring? Lord, not getting along with this person right now, how can I be a blessing to them? A proud person rarely repents in prayer, is not easily taught, and rankles under authority. Well, when I read the list of humble attributes, we all said, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. When I flipped them over and repeated them in the opposite, I bet, I bet we found ourselves there too, right? Honestly, there's things we need to be working on, right? There are, there are things here that we said, oh no, that hit close to home. I need to work on that. 1 Peter 5.5 5 teaches us God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, God is big and scary. He holds heaven and hell in his hands. I don't want God to be opposed to me because I cannot stand up against God. Dan, if you're going to be proud, God is opposed to you. But he gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 3.34, the Bible says, God mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. Yeah, I know how to laugh at other people and look down at other people and, wait a second, maybe I'm not such a big deal as I thought and God's laughing at me for the foolishness of my attitude. I need to repent. I need to repent. I'm not going to fight with God anymore. God, you're right, I'm wrong. That's, those are beautiful words, by the way. God, I'm not going to fight with you anymore. You're right, I'm wrong. So, who wants to be great in God's eyes? Because, you know, God is not impressed with fancy clothes. God's not impressed with shiny cars. God is not impressed with great preaching or, or athletic skills. God isn't impressed by crowds or popularity. God is not impressed by money. God loves a humble person. And God himself is humble. You ever think about that? The greatest of the great. The one, the one who, who just thought it in the universe. Boom, the universe is there. <coughs> the one who sits on a high and exalted throne, king of kings and lord of lords, came down and was born in a manger. And he lived a life and he got tired and he walked among us. And then he let his own creation spit on him and abuse him and beat him and nail him to a cross. And all the while he was loving the one who is most powerful is also the one who is most humble because to be humble is glorious and God does not share his glory with anybody. There's nobody more humble than God. And God has called his children to be like him. Look up to heaven and say, hey, Daddy, I want to be like you. I want to be like you. So God isn't impressed with crowds, popularity, money, big churches, churches with a lot of ministries. God is impressed with humility. Remember back in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus said, come to me. Remember this? Come to me. Everybody who's weary, life is beating you up. You're tired. It's a grind. You're, you're, you're being worn down by your own bad choices, your own sins, your, your hard heart. And you, you've been trying to fight with God and keep him, and it's just making you miserable. Life is making you miserable. Jesus said, just come to me. Just turn around and come to me. Everyone who's weary and, and heavy laden, Come on, I'm going to give you rest, but you've got to come. Quit running away from me. And then he says, take my yoke 
You know, a yoke is what you put on ox so they can pull. He says, here, take this on yourself. We're going to be yoked together. Learn from me. Look at the way I do it. And then what does Jesus say next? He says, learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart. And I've come to a world of hard hearts and lots of pride. Jesus says, do you feel it? Is it breaking you? Is it wearing you down? Your pride is destroying you? Lay it down. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. You're going to find rest. And learn from me. Look. Look at how humble and gentle I am. You will find rest for your souls. So brothers and sisters, maybe sometimes when we don't have rest for our souls, maybe it isn't, God, I need this and I need this and I need this. Jesus is saying, you need to learn how to be humble. Come to me. Lay down your burden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble. And if you do this, if you do learn from me, this gentleness and this humility, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So do I believe it or not? Do we believe it or not? We think the burden of laying down our pride is going to be too much for us. But Jesus tells us that in reality, we're going to find rest. We're going to find rest for our souls when we lay our pride down, when we learn his humble and gentle ways. We start a life of faith when our pride is crushed and we realize we need Christ. We live lives that are pleasing to God by being gentle and humble and being dependent on God, just like a little child. Who's great in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, stop being a big deal. Become like one of these little kids. Become like one of these little kids. Friends, today, if you've been struggling, if you've got that weariness, this heaviness, come to Jesus. Maybe you're a Christian for a long time, but there's a hardness developing in your heart. Lay it down. Become like a little child. Come running back to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I need you. Life's kind of scary right now. Upset, run into the arms of Jesus. Maybe you've been fighting with God all your life, and it's just time to say, I'm done fighting. I see the beauty of humility. I'm not going to struggle with God anymore. I'm just going to give it up. God, you said you love me. I'm going to believe that. You love me? Okay. Thank you. Lord, my ways are so messed up. I confess all of my sins. Please come into my heart. Please forgive me. God, you said you, you forgive somebody. I believe you could even forgive me. So God, forgive my sins, and I want to follow you today, and I want to follow you each and every day of my life. Help me, Lord God, to think of myself as your child. I want to be a child in the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, who's going to be great in the kingdom of God? Well, God looks down from heaven and says, I'm not impressed with that. I'm not impressed with that. There's a humble person who's learning to love people. I like that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please take this morning service and do with it in our hearts whatever you want. I pray that we don't leave an encounter with you unaffected. Please speak to us today and throughout the week. Lord, we want to give you commit permission to break our pride, crush our arrogance, because, Lord, we want to be pleasing to you and we want to be more like Jesus. Thank you for loving us, God. Without that, we'd be lost. You love us, and you forgive us, and you have grace for us. And now, God, because of that, we want to turn around, and we want to love people when they treat us poorly, and we want to be very forgiving, and we want to be, Lord, people full of grace who are not so easily angered and offended. Lord God, please bless us. We need help. That's why we're praying. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.